Welcome everybody to uh, Kanban part one. Uh, before we get going though, I want to take a moment uh, and appreciate my, <laughs> my colleague, um, Alan Brulette. Um, we all, I, I got to introduce myself to lots of you back on uh, the first session of the first day when we talked about um, Foundations of Agile. And I would just like to uh, um, let the guy who really makes this thing run well and puts all the magic into it, as far as I'm concerned, uh, let him talk about himself for a, a couple seconds and introduce himself to you. That's very kind. You're just trying to get out ahead of all the toasts at the retirement testimony. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I am Alan Brulotta. I am the other half of 18F's Allens. Uh, Professor Atlas, who is uh, the front man of our band, has, has taken on the first four of these. Normally, I would pick up the Kanban portion of our lecture, but your questions are all so good and such high traffic in the chat that we've decided to keep the dynamic tab work. Um, a little bit about how I got here. I, uh, I found Agile at GoGo -Go when I got to... Uh, in flight internet folks and discovered that there was a name for the way I had always found myself working. Uh, that name was Agile and particularly Scrum. They're two different things. That was one of the early things I had to learn. Um, that is approximately all I can say about GoGo -Go, considering the 14 page NDA that uh, every now and again reminds me it still exists. I got to teach Agile and Kanban a little bit at a boot camp for uh, folks who were trying to break into software and particularly into design. Before that, I worked in the financial industry, and prior to that, in radio, which was and remains my first love, but alas, you can't make a living at it. Doc, you want to pick up? Did I did I did I do your your graciousness justice? Yes, I, I was just madly trying to find the unmute button, which, as usual, is a lot harder than it should be. At least uh, when I was talking, you weren't looking for the mute button. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, appreciate your your uh, sharing with with uh, sharing with our folks. Okay, and uh, I think we've got a number now. We've got the right number of attendees to make you feel fulfilled. So I'm going to move right on. Um, we have talked a little bit about Agile. We've talked a little bit about Scrum. Uh, somewhere along the way, I hope that and but I hope that we took the time um, for one caveat. And just in case we didn't, I'm going to do it again now, which is. Uh, Agile and Scrum are not the only answer uh, for improving the way your team works at your workplace, doing the work that you do. Uh, they, uh, they, they are not uh, silver bullets. Uh, they are not good for every organization in every situation. And that's why when we bring out this, our quiver, we bring out our toolbox full of tools for improving productivity and quality and customer satisfaction and all of those things. Um, the other thing that we that we find important to cover is this thing called Kanban, um, because Kanban takes a very different view of the world, uh, and it's in fact a little chameleon-like in that it can be quote agile or quote not agile, uh, as the case may be. Um, but it it does work very well in a lot of situations where Scrum might not. So we wanted to go ahead cover that and give you make sure you've got the tools that you need. Um, to make good decisions about how you take your organizations forward. Uh, goals today, I want you to understand, uh, sorry, the goals for today and tomorrow. Uh, I'd like you to understand the main characteristics of what a good Kanban implementation looks like. Uh, I want you to understand how a pull system works and how it matches capacity and demand and why that's great. Um, we'll, we'll go through the beginnings of designing something called the Kanban board. Um, and the other thing that, that is really important about this is um, the, if you find yourself on a team using Kanban, knowing what it means, knowing how things work, and, and being able to effectively be a member uh, of that team. And just for a little bit of fun, at the end of tomorrow, we'll talk a little bit about how you can scale Kanban up to uh, organizational levels in terms of um, size and scope. So. Plenty to talk about for today and tomorrow. Uh, let me uh, let me just underline what Daniel said before. The uh, please participate as early and often. Put some questions in the chat. Um, Brulette will go through those and bring them to my attention. Get them on the table, and we'll start to get some answers going. Um, again, we've tried to 
tried to sort of cover everything we feel we should and yet leave as much time as we can for some discussion. So get those questions in and we'll start on those too. Anything so far, just for fun? <laughs> Not uh, yet. Okay. Um, so we'll talk about sort of the basic premise and the background of Kanban. We'll talk about the Kanban board because that's what it really revolves around, how you represent your process, how you represent work. On that, we'll, we'll go into how pull systems work and what they are and learn about work in progress, um, which is, all we, which is uh, uh, abbreviated WIP, work in progress. We'll talk about WIP limits, uh, delve a little bit into some boring stuff about classes of service and process policies, uh, and that will be more than enough to punish you with today. So why bother? Um, Kanban, like Scrum, claims to improve productivity. Kanban has a slightly different view of the world um, in that it really emphasizes uh, reducing waste uh, because of its strong lean heritage. Um, uh, and it, uh, it does take a look at reducing waste sort of as a, as a principle and obsessive objective. Uh, we want to improve the manageability and predictability of work processes. Kanban is really good at taming chaos. Um, improving morale and team communication, absolutely, it always counts. Um, contented coders write contented code um, and, and that sort of thing. And the other thing that we really like about Kanban, besides all of its flexibility, is it's really easy to begin using it. You, you don't have to change the way you do anything. Unlike with Scrum, where you got to put in a whole bunch of meetings and a special uh, team structure and all kinds of, follow all kinds of rules and do artifacts and things. At the beginning with Kanban, you don't have to do anything. You just sort of, in, you just sort of apply Kanban to what you're doing and then let things evolve over time as they may. So that it can be much, much easier to get going with Kanban. Conversely, Kanban, I will say, does require a lot more discipline um, on the part of a team that's attempting to use it because it really doesn't specify a lot. Compared to Scrum with all of the meetings and the roles and the artifacts and all that stuff, um, Kanban kind of leaves a lot of things open and it's good to apply a lot of the lessons we learn from Scrum to a Kanban environment just so that we have some kind of reasonable structure uh, to add on to things. And of course, that'll be up to you uh, out there in the wild with your teams trying to make this work. So let's talk about kind of the fundamental piece, the visible part of Kanban. I wanna, wanna describe to you what the Kanban board is and how it works. Um, this is the model of work that Kanban assumes. This also comes to us from Lean, and it's something called flow. And in flow, uh, all of the work that you're going to do comes in sort of little tiny pieces, um, and maybe not so much tiny, but it comes in discrete pieces. And of course, because uh, we are humans and we're used to it, our pieces flow in from the left, because that seems natural in our picture. Uh, in the middle, we have the team working on those pieces. Um, and the pieces can be anything the team's expected to, de to deliver. It might be an idea that the team has to turn into a product. It might be an order that the team wants to fulfill and ship to a customer. Uh, could be any kind of anything at all. Uh, in general, the idea is that the team does some kind of work and it does it over and over again. Uh, and that work might be uh, uh, completing user stories by coding is another thing that will fit this flow model. Um, the team works on things one at a time in the model and then value um, releasable product flows out the other side. So we have this sort of endless kind of um, assembly line going, assembly line looking thing going on. And this turns out to be, uh, actually have far reaching consequences and there's math and there's all kinds of stuff that you can read about uh, that turns out to make this uh, a really, really important thing. For us, it's a pretty simple um, model to keep in mind when we apply it to this thing called the Kanban board. Um, so this, this Kanban board uh, is meant to represent that simple flow diagram that we had just above. Uh, and what you have here is a three-column Kanban board. 
the items coming in from the left, the work that must be done, uh, it called, is in a column called to do. And it's represented by a bunch of stickies on the wall. That's the way the pioneers did it when they were traveling, uh, you know, the Oregon Trail. Um, now, of course, those might be items in, a, in a JIRA or some other online tool, but it's very easy to visualize this way. In the middle column, this is when the team is actually working on them. Um, and then finally on the right is the done column after those things have been completed and shipped off or sent to wherever they're supposed to be sent, we're done. So we have, so we're representing the same idea of flow, but now we have it in a, in a way that can go up on the wall and it's going to turn out to help us, help us not only visualize and understand our process, um, but also to manage it going forward. So there's kind of the simplest Kanban board there is. This applies to pretty much anything. Um, and it, it, it can be surprising how difficult it is <laughs> to actually apply this um, because it, even this is imposing a little bit of discipline and order onto um, in, in some um, situations where you're really working with chaos. Um, Brulette, if I could uh, impose upon you, can you take us through this slide? Happily, uh, if at any point, uh, to, to, to the point you were just making, if uh, at any point any of our listeners think, boy, this seems complicated or this seems difficult, this Kanban photo you are looking at here is the family Kanban of our uh, old COO, Josh Bales. If you, if, you, if you look closely at the left side there, Jesse and Josh are also known as Mommy and Daddy. Uh, August was at the time of this board, I think eight, Lucy was five, Finn was three. Yeah, they manage the kids' behavior after school with a Kanban board. Are your toys picked up? Did you read your book? Did you play? Did you go to you know Little League practice? I can't quite read these. I think some of them say trick or treat, so it must have been October um, on here, but it's really this easy. Anytime you start to think, oh, this is complicated, I'm never gonna be able to figure this out, Look at this. Remember this slide where it's written in with marker for three children younger than 10 to keep their parents up to date on what they did that afternoon. This is easier than you think it is. Nice, thanks. Yes, so let's see. Um, so what, what does that Kanban board do? What do we care about? Well, the first thing it does is it makes the process visible. And you saw that it did made that process visible, even though it wasn't in a, at any particularly complex level of granularity. But there's another thing that, this, that, that the Kanban board does that's gonna turn out to uh, have lots of dividends for us. And that is that it, does some, it implements something called a pull system. Uh, that pull system is really all about limiting work in progress, and what it effectively does is it matches demand to capacity. And let me let's talk about sort of how all that works and why it's important. Uh, so uh, here's a representation of the Kanban card. All those little yellow things that we had stuck up there on the Kanban board that we looked at, uh, and I want to take a minute to to tell the original story of Kanban. This seems like a reasonable place to do it because I believe that the, the official Japanese translation of, or the translation of the Japanese word Kanban is either ticket or card. Uh, and where that came from was back when Taiichi Ono was at Toyota and they were trying to, they were inventing lean as they went. One of the things that they noticed was that in manufacturing processes, uh, there was a giant amount of inventory lying around and it cost a lot of money and, uh, in many, many ways. And they wanted to try to, because they were trying to reduce the waste in the manufacturing process, they wanted to try to do something about that. Um, and so what they did was they essentially invented what's now called just-in-time manufacturing, where you don't have big piles of inventory lying around. You get the inventory just as you need it. And in order to make that system work well, what they did was uh, instead of having huge bins or rooms full of parts for a particular station on the assembly line, they would instead give you a small box of parts. And in the bottom of that box was a little, con a little Kanban. And when you got to the bottom of the box, you pulled out the card, handed it to someone who then went off to get another box of those parts. 
Uh, and so that was the way, and because they knew exactly how long it took from the time they handed that off to when the parts would, when the next box of parts would arrive, they were able to continuously manufacture and keep their big expensive machines busy without having to have huge wasteful piles of inventory lying around. Um, so that was a pull system for inventory, essentially, uh, that implemented the just the whole just-in-time manufacturing idea. And that's where this idea of Kanban um, came from. And it was much, much later on, after the Agile movement started, it was actually later then applied to software development and other kinds of, of work processes. Roulette, anything? Checking. Not yet. Nothing okay. you're not going to cover in the next 10 minutes. Okay, <laughs> very good. Um, so let's get back here to our making our process visible. I want to change a little bit of what we have on the board. Um, you can see down the left something, a bunch of items that are ready to be worked on. Uh, some people might call that a backlog. We could, we could actually have a beer and discuss whether that made any sense, but you will see many people do that. For me, I have the backlog somewhere off of the picture and I pull things from the backlog when I want to put them into the process when I'm ready to, to think about working on them. We have, rather than to do now, we have a, we have a column called work in progress, whip, and then done. Um, so we've changed our view of this process a little bit, and the process is that things arrive into the ready column. Um, I can tell you without having any indication that the ready column is listed in priority order, uh, when usually the convention is the upper left is the most the highest priority thing and the lower right is the lowest priority thing in the ready column and as we want to take things in to be worked on we would pull from the upper left and move them into the work in progress column uh, when it was time so those cards are really represent knowledge worker inventory right those cards are they are are they have a cost and we don't like to have a lot of them around, quite frankly, uh, because they, those cards decay, right? That's knowledge stuff. It's stuff like some requirements for a feature. Um, that feature, we put effort into getting that card to even to be ready to be pulled into work. And yet uh, an external event, like a change in technology, uh, a change in features, something else could, could make that card invalid and we've just wasted some work. Uh, we also have an opportunity cost because every time we pick something to work on, we don't pick some, something else. Uh, so the, those cards cost us some money there and we really wanna kind of make sure that we don't overuse them. We don't want a huge pile of them uh, piling up there. Uh, and so what we try to do then is to limit the whip and make things flow as quickly as possible. When we have a giant pile of work to do, maybe in one big job jar, you can't really tell how your process is working. You don't know whether things are held up. You don't know whether things are blocked uh, on various issues. You don't know whether some process, parts of the process are taking too long. So instead we limit the whip, make sure our picture is crystal clear, and so that we can start to manage and visualize every, every piece of that process. So this is what the world looks like when we don't do that. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why this is bad. Um, one of them is that it turns out all that contrary to what some people will say, when there's more work to do than you can possibly do, rather than making it easy, some people like to have a big list of to-dos to work on, but it turns out that for most of us, uh, we have a pre-programmed response to that kind of a situation, which is panic and we kind of experience a little bit of paralysis. So when you're in that sort of situation and you really can't see the end of things, you don't know where you are, uh, and it just looks like you'll be working forever, your productivity, uh, unfortunately, goes down, not up. And so you're even less likely to catch up on it. So we're trying to avoid this overwork problem by using our Kanban process to implement a pull system and, as we said, match demand to capacity. There's always a demand for more work than a team to do, can do, but what we want is a really easy way for the team to manage that over demand. And this is what the pull system is going to do for us. So let's take a look at a slightly more complicated Kanban board. 
Uh, we've got it uh, ready. Then we have estimated analysis. We've got development. We've got test. <clears throat> we finally have done. And you'll notice, you may have noticed, uh, that we've got some numbers now that have appeared up at the top of those three columns in the middle. And those numbers, <clears throat> excuse me, those numbers are the WIP limits. So you'll note that in estimate and analysis column, there are two items being worked on there. Uh, and that means that that column is full. There's no more room for to do any more work there. And the column for development, which has a WIP limit of three, is full, as is test, which is also full. So right now, we can't start on anything new by convention, by the Kanban convention, until we get something done. So we move something from test to done, because we completed the work, and now we have a slot open, um, because we've got a WIP limit of three in our test column, and there's an open slot there. So that means we can pull the work from left to right. Um, so now we move something for, as something completes from development to test, we pull that to the right, and then we've got an open slot in development. So the next thing is finished in estimate and analysis. We can pull that to the right. And finally, we can add, we can take something from the ready column and move that uh, into estimate and analysis. So what we've done is pulled work from the left to the right. The team is insulated from this giant uh, pile of overwork that they've had to deal with in the past. Uh, they get away from the panic and they start to be able to work cleanly on a smaller set of things, get things done more quickly for each item because there's much less waste and confusion. And so that's how we've implemented this idea of a pull system. We're pulling uh, into the system from the left to the right. And in fact, um, <clears throat> people ask, you know, what does it take, you know, what makes it legal Kanban? What, what is sort of minimally viable Kanban, if you will? Uh, and one of the main features of Kanban is this idea of whip limits and a pull system. Uh, so if you don't have that, all you have is a task board. And a lot of people have seen task boards used in Scrum. We didn't have a chance to talk about them in this class uh, or during, the, during this series, uh, but you would, you would learn about task boards in Scrum um, if you took a, a longer training. And you would see that they look a lot like a Kanban board, but they're not, largely because uh, Scrum is actually a small batch process rather than a flow-based process, and uh, it doesn't implement a pull system in the same way. Uh, before I go on, Brulette, you got anything? I've got a handful of questions. A lot. Your these these folks are are, are wising up to us because they're starting to ask a lot of questions where the answer is hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> um, do you have a recommend? Uh, do you have a recommendation for software um, that would help people carry out the Kanban process? There's a lot of things out there that advertise that they are a Kanban software. Is there one that you prefer? I'm, oh. uh, I will. I will jump over you and say I'm a loyalist to tape and post-its. Ah, you, know, you meant the two. Uh, it took me a minute to uh, to catch up there. Yeah. So for the for the tool. Um, just like a Scrum product backlog is best uh, as sticky notes on the wall, um, so is, yeah, I totally agree with, with Brulette. Um, the, uh, you know, tape and stickies on a wall or on a whiteboard somewhere is by far the best and easiest um, Kanban board to work with. It's also the least convenient, um, to be perfectly honest, especially in our world, where in our world, we are almost always in some kind of distributed team. Uh, and it's very, very difficult <laughs> to get everybody to uh, deal with stickies well um, when they're on video, you know, a thousand miles, two time zones away or whatever it turns out to be. Um, the, for, for people in GSA, uh, it turns out that by far the easiest tool to use is called JIRA. Uh, it is not what I would call the best, uh, where best is in quotes. It's not the most faithful or the most lovely uh, of Kanban implementations or Scrum either, as far as that goes, but it's available. It's ATO'd, it's up, it's maintained on an enterprise-wide basis. 
Uh, you just need to email, send an email and get an account, get your project implemented in there and, and off you go. So it's, it's really, really easy, doesn't cost you anything. Um, and more than nine times out of 10, that's gonna be the choice that, that people make. Uh, there are a couple of other well-known Kanban tools out there. LeanKit Kanban is the first one that comes to mind. That's also a pretty good one. And I think LeanKit is the one that supports personal Kanban the best. Personal Kanban being, um, I've decided, <laughs> decided to run my life using Kanban. Uh, and it's just for me, um, which so it, it there are some implications for the tool that that I think LeanKit is the one you can look up personal Kanban on Google and there's a whole movement about that or there was a while back and there were one or two tools that were particularly good at it. Way too long of an answer. Sorry about that. That's all right. They like it. Keep, um, keep. I'm just I want to want to add there that only that I don't want to sound like I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm not in favor of doing this with the distributed teams, and you can do it nearly as well. It's just a long distance relationship. It requires more effort, not less. True enough. Okay, if I don't hear any awful noises, I'm gonna move on. So let's talk about making policies explicit. This is where we start to really understand in complicated, more complicated processes, we start to be able to get very, very crystal clear very clear cut on what's going on. Um, and that helps a lot, especially when you're gonna try to start really slicing down, getting rid of the waste and looking for the highest productivity that you can. Um, so I've got here, you, you now recognize the Kanban board. We've got a couple of, of items on the board. Uh, this is a team that's at the moment not really stressed out, <laughs> we, we can assume. Um, but I do have, I do have a description there in the first, even the very first column, which just, which just is a column for work that's been submitted to be done. And it starts to describe um, what it means to be in that column. So it, if I see something there, it means we received it. It's been logged in someplace. Uh, it includes wireframes. So that kind of implies this might be a user story. And when it's in order to be submitted, it has to have wireframes and other UI guidance so that developers can actually build the thing uh, correctly. Um, and also I see that it includes info to information to reproduce. So that tells me that this is a bug fix because uh, usually with bug fixes in the software world, people always ask for um, instructions on how to reproduce the problem. And then um, of course some wireframes to help guide the solution. So all of those things together are, are required in order for something to make it to the submitted column, which is great because as a, as a member of the team, I know that there's a certain standard that everything that's in the submitted column will achieve, that it will meet, and I can expect to have that kind of information so we don't waste a lot of time running around with poorly formed work to do or poorly described work to do. Now, Clearly, we're begging the question of how do things get into that state, right? Who does that and where do those things come from? Um, the answer is up to you. Uh, what I'm trying to point out now <laughs> is that uh, the rule, the important thing here is there's a rule that says if you're in the submitted column, it means this. And we could go in and add if you're in the estimate column, estimate column, it means this. And if you're in the development column, it means this. So we can start to say, with great accuracy, sort of exactly understand what the work looks like and what the transformation looks like and how, how it goes across the board. And you will find in, you will actually find in complicated Kanban board situations, you will see these descriptions. A lot of them will be posted right on the board, or if not, they'll be in a place where the team can go look for them um, so that everybody understands what's going on in each of those, in each of those hey, columns. Um... A simple mnemonic for the the policies and processes because we we a lot of 18f operations was originally built on Kanban, particularly agreements and staffing. More on that later, but the one that we found useful for remembering what that means, where we have column criteria, is think about a restaurant that tells you you must have your whole party present to be seated. That's a power. That's that's the rule. You know, nice. you can't get in the line to get seated until all four or six or eight of you are there. Same thing. Love it, love that. 
You've never mentioned that till now. You've been holding out on me. I keep surprising you on your way out the door, Doc. You do. <laughs> you do. Just don't surprise me at home late at night. <laughs> I suppose okay. the context we should give folks here is that you are uh, just a couple of days from terming out. So by all means, stay tuned. This is going to get more and more exciting. Yes, and that's why I'm talking fast. So anyway, moving on. Um, we talked about policies and transitions. Here is the way that we can specify a transition. We have two opportunities um, to specify things here. One is the state of, of a work item that's in a, in a column. The other one is the requirements to make the transition from one column to the next. Uh, and so you can see that what it takes to move from development to test is that the code's checked in, we've done our static code analysis, we have no warnings, uh, we have, can build and run it from the official build, and the developers have already tested it. So this would be an environment where there's a separate test station of some kind or a separate test person uh, to do official QA. And this is a description of the transition of what is required to make the transition from development to test. Again, this means less back and forth, less confusion, less um, sort of um, half steps in the process, all of which reduces the waste and keeps things running smoothly. All right, let's talk about um, start, starting your Kanban board. As always, uh, we both are big advocates for coaches, uh, Kanban coaches or Agile coaches. Uh, the coaches really can help you. It's not like this stuff is complicated or hard, but it does in practice turn out to be sort of tricky to implement. Uh, and you can do it through trial and error. Uh, it's just way easier to get somebody who's already been through that and who's good at coaching a team into learning how to kind of take the responsibility on for themselves. Uh, so we definitely, we definitely uh, uh, recommend that you get someone to come and help you. Uh, starting next Monday, that would be Brulette, not me. Um, <laughs> um, but you definitely will, you'll, you'll avoid a whole bunch of errors uh, and missteps if you get someone to help you that's been through it before. So the first step is that you map and analyze the value chain. The value chain is really, really simple. It's not a complicated thing. It's just all the steps it takes when, you're, when some new work enters into your system, all the steps it takes for it to leave your system. So if a new piece of work enters your system as an idea, then there's a whole lot of work to go through fleshing out the idea, um, uh, vetting the idea, figuring out how to implement the idea, implementing it, testing it, documenting it for users, and all of that stuff. There's a lot of steps in that value chain. Um, if, if things enter your value chain as a customer order, um, and they leave your value chain as a fully built, fully built custom automobile that is your very own choice, of a set of options for it, uh, there's a quite a lot of steps in along that value chain. Uh, lean people view every single step in the value chain as an opportunity to get rid of some waste, which it is, um, but it's also an opportunity to make a mistake uh, and to ha have complexity. So we would, in, so for whoever you are, um, whether you're doing software or, um, uh, putting agreements together or some legal function or an operations function of some kind. Um, we start and we map we figure out the different kinds of work you do. We map and analyze the value chain. Uh, we throw some buffers into the Kanban board that we'll talk about a little bit in a little bit. Um, uh, that might actually be tomorrow. And we'll just guess on some WIP limits. Uh, we said we have to have them, but we don't really know what they will be except by trial and error. So we'll make a guess and see how that works. Uh, we'll create the board. On the wall is by far the easiest when you start out and then putting it into a tool later on, uh, much easier than trying to build the whole thing from scratch in a tool, in my experience. So that's my, if you can get part of your team together and kind of get started that way before you jump into JIRA or something, you'll, you'll find that's a lot easier. 
Um, so we take a look at the value chain and why can I, I am having trouble. There we well, go. Hope okay. Your filibuster will uh, get your animation working. Susan had asked, what do you mean by the value chain? Susan, the value chain is essentially how you do what you do. You know, the raw material comes in one side, the finished product goes out the far side, everything in the middle, the steps in the middle of the value chain. Doc, about right on that? Absolutely right. It's the work that you do, right? It's the reason your, your team exists. It's what you do. Um, this just has you thinking about it as an ordered set of steps rather than a large glump of a whole bunch of work. This is the place you're going to start learning things right out of the box when you set up your board because within the first two steps, you're going to say, how do you do what you do? And someone on your team will say, well, the first step is we X. And someone will say, no, it's not. And then you will immediately be learning how you work. Which, as I recall, was your first experience <laughs> when you tried it with the, with agreements, right? It can it, it, contentious. Uh, the separating how you actually get things done from how you think you get things done, wish you got things done, or believe you ought to get things done is the uh, is the courageous is the courage required part of building a Kanban board. Is admitting now that it's uh, it's it's the difference between how you would tell the doctor you eat versus the food log you keep scrupulously honestly. <laughs> So uh, we thought we'd branch out a little bit and get into maybe some kind of a media-oriented uh, Kanban board. Um, and here we have one here. Uh, we've got, we start with an outline and move to a draft, then we add graphics, uh, and finally we go for approval, and then we're done. Uh, so that's our value chain. Those are all the different, uh, all the different steps that we have to do the work. Uh, and um, now we said, well, we, we certainly need before we before we go too much further, as we design our board, we realize we need to put a place for the work that we haven't started yet. So we've got now the submitted column over on the left, um, and that's that's where the work that's ready to be to be done is. And we put in some trial whip limits. We just kind of guessed because, and I'm making this up. I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that there's one graphics person and two writers on this team. I'm just, I'm making that up. Um, but this, but somewhere around there is, um, is about the size of this team. And we just invented these whip limits and we'll, we'll start by following them quite well, quite closely, and we'll see how it goes. And you will know within days uh, whether one of them is too small or one of them is too big. Uh, the overall goal, is to bring is to make the whip limits as small as possible and the reason is because as you do that it requires you to be much more uh have much more clarity and be much more careful with your process um so when you finally get to the if you could get to one 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 uh something like that and you had one person on the team or two 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 and you had two people on the team it would be awesome um, because there would be, there's no room for slack. There's no room for sloppiness. Everything has to work sort of picture perfect. And we just start to pull things across uh, and, and so forth and, and just let the process uh, work itself out. There's, there's uh, lots and lots of complexity in the Kanban board. I, we, we, uh, I implied way back at the beginning that Kanban, uh, Kanban can be used to represent and manage any flow-based process. So we've got a lot of complexity yet that we have not covered. Uh, one thing is the, this idea of there are different kinds of work that a team might do. Uh, and sticking with our media example here, uh, we've got uh, two kinds of work that our team does. One is that we produce feature articles. And another kind of work we do is we produce blog posts. And for writers, those are two very different animals. Um, and so we've actually decided to track them in two different areas on our Kanban board. So now we have what are called swim lanes. Uh, and that's after the, the idea that you've all seen when you watch Olympic swimming, you know, everybody swims in their lane in parallel, sort of independently as they go, but all in the same pool. That's what we've got here. Clearly, 
Uh, we really think that feature articles are important to our organization. Uh, in fact, we want to invest, it looks like about 75% of our available bandwidth on feature articles. And we want to, we'll spend the, uh, the other 25% on blog posts. And you see that because you can see that there are whip limits for the swim lanes. And so that nine there for feature articles means that all the way across that swim lane, we now have a rule. I can have only nine um, feature article work items in flight at any given time. That because that fits the amount of work they take with the size of the team and the, the way the team likes to work. And if you count, you will see, amazingly enough, that nine is the number that there are in that uh, in that swim lane horizontally. You can quickly see that we've said that at most we want three blog posts in flight at any given time. And sure enough, there are three in flight. <clears throat> if you look closely again now, if you look at the outline column, you'll see that we've got three things. We have a whip limit of three and we have, um, and we have uh, three things in that column. In draft, we have a whip limit of three. We only have two in that column, which is fine perfectly legal, we would have room to move something across uh, if something was ready to go. And the sort of rule in this kind of a situation is you're required to meet the whip limits both horizontally and vertically. Uh, and that keeps you from blocking up on somebody or some process step uh, with a whole lot of stuff that just isn't moving anywhere. Make sure that everything can continue to flow as it's ready. All right, got a question on swim lanes. Aiden Feldman, I'm going to paraphrase your question, and if I get it wrong, please jump in and and, uh, and rewrite it. Doc, what do you do if you have one team doing multiple kinds of work, but they aren't all the same steps? Is it better to um, is it is it better to have multiple boards or to have more generic yeah. columns? Uh, there's a th <laughs> um, there's a third option there. Uh, and you, so the reason you don't like multiple boards is because one of the things you really want to be able to do is come up to your Kanban board and know, know what your whole team is doing, like all at once and kind of have it all visualized in one place. And as soon as there's two boards, you start to have the chance of over, you know, uh, of overloading some part of your team. Um, or so forth. I mean, if they're really separate groups, then they're really separate teams, and that's a different idea. But if it's one team that's doing two different kinds of things, you really want to show that all on one board, or you lose some of the magic, some of the reason why you went to Kanban in the first place. There's another uh, option for that, and we haven't gone into it much, uh, but you can, <laughs> how, how would I describe it? Imagine you put a double line um, st a strong, thick, dark double line between these two swim lanes, between where it says feature articles and blog posts, um, then you could, th then you can actually have a different number of columns under blog posts um, because I've separated them a little bit. Uh, and, and there's a, several different ways to finagle that representation. And we're not going to have time to go into it in detail, but that would be in lots of cases, that's the that's kind of your preferred approach because you get everything onto the same board. Because I do want to see what the total layout of work and the total flow of work through the team is. Uh, you can only do that in one place. Did that help at all? I, that was a lot to try to explain. Yeah. I was yeah, I got okay. Because I promise I was waving my hands a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess my question was like, you know, the, the whip limits kind of only work if you have one column that that whip limit applies to, but you know, if you have a row for hiring or something, mm -hmm. let's just say like, those are very different steps, but it still takes people's time. Sure. Yep. And you know, throw in a, um, you know, change the number of columns, put it, throw in a header in the middle of the, you know, across that last swim lane, uh, put in your own whip limits for that swim lane and you know, off you go. You, the point is, the point here is to understand why you want to do Kanban and then just make it work for you. Speaking of the other question, I'm going to field this one. D. Waldron says, when do you remove cards from done when you run out of space on the wall? 
<laughs> it is super good for morale, particularly if, like me, you're prone to having those days of I never get anything done, to look over at the done column and see it sticking out six inches from the wall with a thousand post-its on it. Yep, very true. There is something about that huge monster, almost living lump. Um, great satisfaction can be taken. So I, I underline your answer there. And I think this may be, ah, so coming now just to show a little bit more of a Kanban board, um, but you ought to be able to kind of decipher this one now that we, based on what we've been through so far, you can see our backlog, stuff that's ready to be worked on. <clears throat> we've divided the board up a little bit. Uh, our work in progress actually has three different columns uh, ready for demo if you had to do it. Um, you know, you could, you could look down at the bottom underneath ready for demo and you can see some description about what's going on in that column. So they've actually used the whiteboard for all of the different pieces that we've talked about. Uh, things go from left to right, um, notes at the bottom, um, and the, the, the cards for the work items um, have whatever information is useful. If you look closely, you can see that this particular team has settled on a pretty um, carefully done format for the cards. There's a title for it in the middle, and I don't know, there's stuff across the bottom and on the right-hand corner and the left-hand corner, uh, and I don't know the details of what they are, but the, the, um, this is a free-form exercise in you designing your work Man, your workflow management system to be something that you uh, that that works for your team. You can see the whip limits. Also, I'll point out uh, four for backlog, three for testing, um, five ready for demo, um, and and I think you can sort of intuitively understand why you don't want to let uh, let any of those columns sort of overflow because uh, it means something's not going anywhere. And at a certain point, if you have 37 things ready for demo you've just blown it. You're, you're never going to demo them all. Um, you don't really know why, what's going on, how to get, which ones to get rid of. So it really does make you want to keep up with the flow and moving things all the way from left to right um, through to done and eventually off the board to your huge pile on the wall. If you look closely at this board, they've done two really interesting things with that. One, they've got their process and, and policy right there in the bottom. Uh, at the bottom of the ready for demo column, if you squint, you can see it says schedule demo when two features are ready for demo. Yep. So they know they can have five back up. Also, if you look closely, they've got little stickums or clips. I can't quite make out what those are, but they have a whip limit of five things in ready for demo, and there are only five spaces for cards full stop. They can't cram eight or 10 in there. Once they run out of stickies, their whip limit is enforced on itself. Oh, yeah. And if you look close, so those are, it's like a little holder. I think they're using index cards because if you look at the mm -hmm. purple cards under dev and testing and done, you see the little white tab coming across the top, coming down the top there. That's holding that card in place. Their uh, policies and processes, they're even having a little bit of fun with it. If you look at the bottom of the done yeah. column there, right. enjoy a pint. Yes, perfectly legal to have fun with this. Any more questions? Did we, did we miss anything? Lots of exciting things coming next time, uh, tomorrow. We'll talk about how to deal with blocked items, how to put things onto your board, which is called replenishment. Um, what do you do with those, with... Uh, the, the uh, emergency ones that kind of interrupt everything else. And uh, then again, we'll talk about enterprise scaling too, which is a little bit of fun. More questions right. from today. Um, yeah, Teresa, where does, the, go ahead, Teresa. You can ask that question aloud. Um, hi there, other hi. Alan. Um, <laughs> as opposed to OA, I suppose that's not right. But anyway, uh, product owner, uh, I can kind of understand where uh, the scrum master would fit, but is that person on or role on the outside of this, this box of Kanban? Is, it, is there something comparable to that role? You know what, I, uh, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, and and I'm, um, I'm agreeing with it while I frantically search for a reason uh, for a hidden reason not to. Um, so the product owner, 
So if, if we were kind of imposing a lot of our scrum approach on top of Kanban, then off to the left, let me back up a little bit. Um, so off to the left, before things got into the backlog column here, the, the product owner is going to have a, big lar a much larger backlog, and the product owner is going to prioritize on that backlog and make sure that stories are ready to be worked on, and they will be the sort of driver of backlog grooming activities and all that. And the product owner is going to be the one who knows what to do with all of the stuff that's done. Um, because that's going to actually be living inside the the product that's growing, you know, iteratively over um, each over time. We haven't, we don't even really have sprints here yet. We haven't said anything about that. You can do it with sprints or without. So yeah, I think the product ba the product owner, with the exception of questions from someone in the dev or test column who says, "Well, wait a minute, you know, what color did you want this, or did you really want it to act in the following way?" Um, or I found when I was testing, I found this crazy behavior. Is that what you wanted? And, you know, except for answering those kinds of questions, I think that's fair to say that the product owner probably works around the edges of this board rather than in the middle of it. That, that was my assumption, actually, um, that they were sort of sitting out there yep. throwing uh, tasks at the pile. But um, it, because the um, uh, how important they were would be how important they were to the product owner. But thank you very much. That was good. Sure, sure. Although I, I I'd prefer it if it, the how important was how important they were to the customer, uh, as 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 uh, discovered by the product owner. We we don't want to be building the product owner's baby. We want to build the baby that the customers want. Of course. Just checking. We've. We've had three questions now on blockers. There's a two-part answer. The first part of how to deal with blocked items is we're covering that tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> the second part of that answer, Daniel Pino, when are we covering that tomorrow? <laughs> hey there. So the next presentation is Introduction to Kanban Part 2 at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. Uh, make sure you register. Uh, we'll drop that registration link into the chat window and we hope you can join us. Um, may I also do my final closeout? Is that cool with you guys? Absolutely. Awesome. It is though. I'm going to come back and a couple more questions after you do, but I wanted to make sure you got your plug in. Perfect. Uh, so we love getting your feedback and what you share with us helps us uh, produce better and more high quality content. So we can't thank you enough. So we're sending out the link to the presentation evaluation form. So please take a second or two to just fill that out. And if you are enjoying the Agile Talks, we invite you to join the Agile Community of Practice. Signing up is easy. Simply visit um, the website link um, in the chat box, and we hope you can join us. Uh, take it away, Alans. Thank you. John Redder, question. Can you unmute and read it yourself? All right, I will assume the answer to that is no. John Rutter, Doc, wants to know, do cards move forward when completed or only when there is room column? Um, it's a combination. So the, um, the, the pull system says a card can only move when there's room in, in the receiving column in the next column over. But we also know that the card can only move when it meets the transition or the policy. So when it's ready, then it, when it's ready and there's room for it in the next column, that's actually when it can move. You need both of those conditions to be in place. I think that was what the question was. That's what I would have answered too, is both. There has to be room, but it also has to be done. You will have laid right. out your policies and transitions. You know if it's done or not, then you just have to wait for space. What you can't have is a push system where someone comes in and says, yeah, but this one's really urgent, so expand your whip limit. Um, the support of leadership on and above the team to honor whip limits is probably the most important thing to doing this successfully. Was that a question? Certainly. No, that was a statement. Certainly oh, okay. the government. <laughs> yes, everywhere. Absolutely um, right. Ryan Ahern, unmute and hit us. Hey, um, so I was wondering, what's the best way to signal that a card is ready to move? 
um, assuming that the next column is handled by a different person, like from the writer in drafts to the graphics person? Um, most, so let's see. I don't want this to be too long. Kanban teams tend, can be bigger than scrum teams. They're not, we don't have the same team size requirement. So they can be, you know, they can be sometimes a couple dozen people even. But even so, uh, a feature of Kanban is the daily meeting where everyone hovers around the Kanban board, either online or on the wall, uh, and goes through uh, and looks at what's on the board. And one of the main things the the Kanban, uh, the, the, the daily Kanban meetings usually start from the right um, because what you're always trying to do is find a way to pull cards and move them to the right as you go. So for many Kanban teams, that would get picked up during the daily meeting. It might not be signaled on the card itself, but the next morning, the project manager, the project lead, the Kanban master, whoever, scrum master person would be going, how can we move some cards? And somebody who had worked on that card that was done would say, wait a minute, I think that card's done, we can move it. Uh, and very often, and that's perfectly fine. Um, I believe that there's a mechanism in JIRA to indicate that. Uh, and there's another thing that will, and, and we'll also talk about the role of something called buffer columns that make that actually pretty easy to do. So you got several choices there. Selena, unmute and ask that one, please. What do you think? Is it kosher for a card to move backwards? Like, for example, if it does not pass testing and needs more dev? Big question. Um, worse than that is if, if it doesn't pass, <laughs> if it doesn't pass testing, what do you do if there's no room in the, pre in the previous column to, you know, then where does it go? Uh, and, and it's also often the case that uh, there's a separate block somewhere, a uh, separate place to go for cards that get into odd situations like blocked, for instance, and it's sort of going off to the side and then back. Um, answer is you, you really, so there's no rules. Um, you have to figure out what works best for you or your team. And it sort of depends on how often it happens and how complicated things get at that point. But I'm going to have to, I'll leave that one up to the interested team to figure out because it'll be different. Yeah, I would just say if a card has to move backwards, probably you should look closely at that, particularly if you see it happen multiple times. Maybe you have your columns not quite uh, adjusted the way you want them to be or you, you are about to learn something. Aiden Feldman, last question. Yeah, uh, what did I write? Um, so the whip <laughs> limits, so I noticed that you've been doing them per column. Yes. Uh, do you always think about them that way or sometimes do you do it like two, you know, in progress is two per person or something? Uh, I don't understand the question. Are the whip limits also are always like the overall number for a column or would you sometimes do a, a whip limit per, per Yeah, so like, you know, two per dev or something. So that's, that's the place where most people start before you have any idea. Um, but it turns out that a team is a team and it's not, a, it's not exactly, it's more or, or less, it's different from the number of individuals on the team. So that two per person is a great place to start. You might find that for some columns, that's, that's, two, that's one too many or three too little. I mean, you, that's why you have to figure that out in practice. But, but you've, you've touched on probably the, one of the most, one of the easiest ways to decide a good place to start. And it, it's not hard. Yeah, I mean, once you start doing this, it becomes really obvious really fast where you need to change a whip limit and it's not working right. And, and you get to either change the limit or change what you're doing to improve it and make it go more smoothly and with less overhead. So you do have those two options. All right, 301 or one minute after the hour, I suppose, to accommodate all time zones. <laughs> Daniel, you need to wrap us up. Nope, I think we're good. Just remember tomorrow's presentation is at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time, and we hope you can join us. Thanks again, y'all, everybody. Thanks for coming. Oh, Thank you, folks. See you all tomorrow.